Before we get into making stuffed Agnolotti del Plin, a pure act of love and a wonderful Christmas tradition in the region of Piedmont in northern Italy, we first need to get started making pasta dough, which I like to do the day before I'm going to make this pasta. So this recipe starts yesterday. So for the dough, we're going to bust out a scale and we're going to get some double zero flour. It's a more finely milled Italian flour for pasta. And we're going to measure out 454 grams of the flour. Then we're going to add five eggs and we're going to measure that out. It's going to be about 200. 170 grams. Beat up those eggs, create a well with the flour, and pour the eggs into the well, and then use a fork and start to scramble the eggs, slowly working in some flour from the wall of flour around the edge. After you've worked in a bunch of that flour and you've created sort of a thick pancake batter consistency, use a bench scraper and start to then fold in the flour, cutting the flour into the dough until it starts to come together and you can compress it into a ball. And once it's in a ball, then you can begin to knead it. At this point, you really gotta channel your Nona sense. It's similar to the spidey sense, but it's just a sense that tells you where your dough is at, what it needs, and what it doesn't. And my spidey sense is telling me that the dough is a little dry. So first I'm gonna scrape off all the excess flour from the board, and then I'm just gonna get a feel for the hydration of the dough with my hands and my senses. And once it comes together to a roughly smooth ball, I'm gonna try and seal the back. And if it doesn't pinch together like this, it's too dry. So I'm gonna run my hands quickly under some water. I'm not gonna get them like soaked, just a little damp and then I'm gonna then work that moisture into the dough and I know once I'm able to pinch the dough closed then it's ready to be wrapped and we can let it rest and we're just gonna let it rest on the board for about 15 minutes to further hydrate it's gonna get softer and it's gonna be easier to knead so we're gonna wrap it and we're gonna set it on the board for 15 minutes to rest in the meantime we can talk about the short rib I've got about three and a half to four pounds of short ribs and they're bone-in English cut but you want to be picky about them you want to get meaty short ribs sometimes they give you like fatty there's no meat on the bone you want to make sure you get really lean pieces otherwise just get more because that three and a half four pounds is accounting for the loss we're gonna have for the bones if you use boneless short ribs you could probably get away with around two and a half pounds then we're just gonna salt them heavily and then get them into a refrigerator uncovered to rest and dry out that surface of the meat overnight so that when we sear it tomorrow we can get a really nice sear now it's been about 15 minutes and that dough is nice and rested and it's begun to hydrate a little bit further. It's gonna make it a little easier for us to continue to knead right now. You can see it's a little shiny on the exterior. So you can see the gluten starting to develop. So we're just gonna go ahead and knead it and we can see how like the dough closes and seals on itself as I knead it. That's what you wanna see. That's an indication of a properly hydrated dough, but the air is so dry this time of year. As I'm kneading it, I can feel the dough drying out and it's struggling to seal it itself which is telling me I'm gonna have to work in a little bit more moisture, especially because we're making a filled pasta. I wanna make sure I avoid an overly dried dough. And as you can see, it's not sealing when I pinch the back. The dough also visibly looks dried out. So again, I'm just gonna run my hands quickly through that water. I'm gonna knead that into the dough and I'm just gonna work it until I can feel it's nice and hydrated. The surface of the dough is nice and smooth and the back seals up nicely. And after about another five or 10 more minutes of kneading, this dough is ready to be rewrapped. If you wanna use this the day of, you're gonna let it rest for another two or three hours on the table but for this recipe we're making it the next day so we're going to pop this into the refrigerator and use it tomorrow when we need it and so now what i have here is that dough that's been resting in the refrigerator all night i don't need to use it quite yet but i am going to let it just hang outside of the fridge allow it to come down to room temperature it'll stay wrapped and when we're ready to use it it'll be nice and easy to work with. Now we can talk about the filling, or in Italian it's called ripieno. That's some sort of stuffing. Now here I've got the short ribs that we salted last night and have been sitting over the fridge and that salt has penetrated deeply and the surface of the meat has dried out so we can get a nice brown on it. There is no official recipe for agnolotti de plin. It's more of a technique of the pinch that makes it unique. But I've seen veal, I've seen pork, I've seen rabbit, I've seen chicken, or a combination of any of those. All those combinations are great. I figured I'd go straight with short rib today. Why do you ask? Because A, the short rib meat is some of my favorite meat on the cow, and it's gonna come with these bones. And these bones are gonna cook in the broth with the short ribs. And just like we would do when we make our own stock or our own broths, those bones are gonna fortify the cooking liquid that we're then going to take 
reduced down into a sauce for the pasta later on. So adding a lot of strong flavors to that cooking liquid is what we want, and that short rib bone is gonna do just that. Now you can throw in some pork bellies, some pork butt, some veal, some rabbit, some chicken. I've never seen rabbit in my life at a grocery store, so that's more of an Italian thing. But whatever you wanna use, you can use. The idea of this recipe was to just use leftover roasted meats. And we're gonna be roasting our own meat, but just remember that idea, this is a, a utilization recipe. You can use sort of whatever you want to fill it. I've even seen recipes with donkey meat, so. Now all we have to do is just prepare some aromatics to cook the short rib with, and we can get this guy in the oven. I don't need a ton of stuff. I'm just gonna get one celery, a little carrot. I like a lot of garlic here, and then a small little onion. Mash the garlic roughly. Give these a quick wash. And then we really wanna chop everything kind of roughly. This will all get strained out in the end. So how you cut it does not really matter too much. And then we're gonna add some herbs. I've got a little bit of thyme, a little bit of rosemary, and a little bit of sage. And then I'm gonna take some whole peppercorns and just measure out maybe 10 of those into a little bowl. This is four cups of brodo. You could use four cups of uh, beef broth, chicken broth, bone broth, whatever you've got. Just make sure it's a good quality. You know, something that's got a little body to it. And then to pair well with this, we're gonna go with a Barbera di Asti. It's from Oliviola in Italy, which is in the northern part of Italy near Piedmont. And so generally, if I'm making an Italian recipe from northern Italy, then I'm gonna look for a northern Italian wine. If I'm making a Tuscan recipe, I'm gonna look for a wine that was produced in Tuscany. If I was making a Sicilian recipe, I would wanna find a Sicilian wine produced in southern Italy. So if you're ever curious about wine to get, that could be your guiding principles and then make sure that it's just a good quality wine that you're gonna wanna drink because you're not gonna use the whole bottle and you wanna drink it afterwards. Mmm, it's like deep and it's rich. You can smell it and almost imagine it reduced down, coated in butter, intensely flavored sauce that it will become in the end of this recipe. So now we got our wine, we got our stock. With the peppercorn, I need a little bit of bay leaf. So we've got our aromatic herbs, we've got our vegetables, and we've got our meat. Let's hop on over to the stove and get this started. I'm gonna use a big Dutch oven for this, and we're gonna get it preheated on medium-high heat, and I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil. And once it's hot, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna toss in these short ribs, meat side down. Make sure we brown these really well on all sides of the meat. It'll take about five to 10 minutes, so just take your time. And once you've browned all sides, then we can go ahead and add in the vegetables. I threw the vegetables directly into the meat and we're just gonna let those saute almost fry a little bit I'm gonna raise the heat because I just added more things to the pan which cooled it down if you want you can remove the meat give the vegetables more space to caramelize once we've got some nice color on the vegetables and some fond on the pan we can turn that heat down to low we can add in about one to two cups of that red wine at this point you can add the meat back into the pan and we want to reduce that red wine all the way down by at least double continue to let this reduce until it begins to sort of thicken and glaze up at the bottom. We can go ahead and add peppercorn, the bay leaf, and the herbs. Stir everything together. At that point, then we can add in the broth. Bring that broth up to a boil, and once it's boiling, we're gonna add a lid to the pot, and we're gonna toss that into a 350 degree oven, and we're gonna cook that for three hours in total, but I'm gonna set a timer for two hours. Give it a check. After two hours, I'm gonna use this cake tester right here. I'm just gonna see where we're at. I'm gonna use the cake tester, I'm gonna poke the meat, see how soft and tender it is. It's getting nice and tender, it's getting nice and brown, but what we're now gonna do is remove the lid and cook it uncovered for one additional hour. Set a timer, and then an hour later, we're gonna check back. After that one hour, that sauce should be reduced. The whole pot should be darkened. The meat should be browned and caramelized and it should be a really deep flavor. We can use that cake tester. We can see how soft the meat is. It's sort of tearing, it's falling off the bone. It's perfect. What we wanna do is fish out that short rib meat, remove those bones, and then we wanna take a spatula and we wanna use the moisture in that pot to almost deglaze the sides of the pan of all that good fond. And then what we can go ahead and do is, is strain that whole mixture out into a bowl, squeezing all the juices that are left in those vegetables and that garlic and the herbs. And what we'll separate in that jar is essentially a demi-glaze, a reduced stock, and then like a short rib bone marrow fat on top, both of which we're gonna use in the filling. I'm just gonna put it in a fat separator so I can access both and set it off to the side. While that cools, we can prepare the spinach. And I think I'm done using baby spinach. From now on, I'm using this large leaf spinach. It just is so much better. It's dirty, so we're gonna have to wash it, soak it in some water, drain it out a few times, and then run it through a salad spinner. But the flavor in this large leaf spinach is so much better than the baby spinach, I find, especially when you're gonna saute it, which is what we're gonna do. So once that spinach is dry, 
side, we're gonna take a few cloves of garlic and we're gonna slice those really thin. And we're gonna get a high rimmed pot on the stove over medium high heat. And I'm gonna fill the bottom with olive oil. Once that olive oil is hot, I'm gonna toss in that garlic and I really wanna toast that garlic. I wanna get it lightly browned. You're gonna smell the aroma change as it's browning. And once we've got that nice color developing around the garlic, I'm gonna go directly in with all of that spinach. And then I'm gonna take a spatula and like a smash burger, just smash it into the bottom of the pan and it's gonna release the moisture in that spinach fast. And since the pan's really hot, it'll evaporate that moisture quickly and it'll make really great textured spinach. I'm gonna season it with salt, I'm gonna turn the heat off and that residual heat should continue wilting that spinach, not overcooking it, maintaining a really bright dark green color and resulting in perfect spinach. That's so good you could eat it right out of that bowl, but don't because we need it for the filling. But save that technique for a quick and easy side. So I got my food processor out. We're just gonna add our short ribs to that. I'm gonna take off any of the sinew, make sure I get all the meat off of it. We like the fat in this recipe, but we don't like sinew. So I'm just gonna go through that sinew and make sure I pick out all the meat. Then I'm gonna go in with the spinach, about a half cup of Parmigiano Reggiano. And I've got about a one cup of that reduced demi-glaze. I'm gonna add about a quarter of it directly to the mixture, along with a few tablespoons of that fat. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and then I'm gonna run the processor and puree that mixture until it's nice and smooth. Give it a taste, adjust the seasoning. And then what we wanna do is get that entire mixture into a piping bag and we've got our filling ready to go. I'm just gonna let it chill in the refrigerator until we're ready to use. Now we can begin to work on actually shaping and filling the pasta. First step I wanna do is get a sheet tray. I'm gonna cover it with semolina flour. I'm gonna coat the whole thing. Then we'll get our dough. The right texture, it's bouncy, it's hydrated. Beautiful, nice and soft. Now I'm gonna work with it in quarters. I'm gonna cut it in half. You see the nice air bubbles we worked in? I'm gonna cut that quarter in half. Keep the rest covered. And then whenever I'm rolling out pasta dough, I like to start out by getting it flattened and make sure it's nice and evenly flat. The more even it is when you put it into the machine, the more even it'll roll out. So what I'm just trying to do is create some sort of a rectangle or square that's gonna result in a nicely shaped pasta dough once it's rolled out. That looks good to me. And now we're gonna roll out the pasta. Now set up your pasta machine and if your dough is properly hydrated, you're not gonna really need flour. You wanna start at the zero setting or the widest setting and roll it through. And then you wanna flip the dough to the other side and run it through again. Then you wanna turn the setting up to one, roll the dough through it, flip that dough to the other side just to make sure we have a nice even roll. And then we're gonna work our way up until the eighth setting. Eighth is pretty thin. When I'm doing a pasta like this, has a lot of folds to it. So the thinner the pasta, the better. So once we've got our really long pasta dough that we just ran through the eighth setting of the machine. I want to get it onto the cutting board and I want to cut it into either two or three sheets that I'm then going to stack on my board right in front of me nice and neatly. And I'm just going to trim off the imperfect edges. Then you should have matching pasta sheets that we can then begin to fill. I'm gonna take my filling and I'm going to cut the tip about the thickness and width of my thumb. And then we can begin to pipe. And we're gonna make the annulotti di plim with these sheets. But to show you the difference, I'm gonna use these to show you what regular annulotti look like. You add a little piece of the filling into a piece of the pasta. I hit with a little water to close the dough. Fold it over. Whenever you fold the pasta, you go from one thickness to a double thickness. So we need to squeeze that double layered pasta back into a single layer pasta. And then we take a fluted pasta roller. These are regular annulotti. By the way, plin translates to pinch in Italian. So this is just the pinched annulotti technique. But there are a few differences. So I'm gonna take this sheet and I'm gonna start to pipe out these little dollops, ideally with about a thumbnail's width space in between those dollops. These are a little too tight, so they're gonna give me a little bit of trouble. So try and space them out a little bit more. Then I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of water from a little spray bottle to allow the pasta to stick. And then you wanna grab the edge of the dough closest to you and gently fold that over over the filling to meet the other side of the dough so that there is a little bit of excess with your index finger and your thumb squeeze and pinch that space between each piece of filling. You're gonna create these little square pockets that should seal in the filling. Again, you're forming a double layer of pasta, so when you pinch it, you really have to pinch it down to a single layer. And you want us to make sure if there's any of that dough that overlaps onto the flat part of the pasta, you pinch that down as well. Then we're gonna take the pasta cutter with the fluted side, and we're gonna cut the pasta where it's laying flat, about a thumbnail away from the filling. 
And now you're gonna cut between each piece of filling. So you wanna spritz it one more time with water so where you cut it seals with the flat piece of dough that's laying on the board. And once you go through and cut in between each piece of filling, you have yourself beautiful little enulote. This is a much better batch. I use my thumb, I use it to give enough space in between each piece of filling. And I've also given myself a nice little border so I can seal in those pockets a lot better when I fold that sheet over the pieces of filling. It's almost like a burrito. You pull it over a little bit too much, so when I pull it back in to pinch the edges, that excess pulls in as well. We really just wanna minimize the amount of folds we have because every time we fold it we double up the layers of dough and all that does is open up an opportunity for there to be crunchy uneven bits of the pasta once it's cooked so again once you've made all your pinches you want to make sure you also flatten out where the two pieces of dough meet on the board i like to pull that little strand up just to make sure it's not stuck to the board before i cut it another spritz of the water and then to take the fluted edge make those cuts seal those edges and you've got another batch of beautiful annulo and i mean for me you could stuff this with anything it's just a beautiful shape of pasta it's pretty genius and it's definitely one of my favorite and set that all on the sheet tray with the semolina we got our annuletti de plin very nicely made that's how to finish this recipe up first thing we want to do is get some water on the stove up to a boil and i'm not going to make all this at pasta i'm probably going to make around a third to a half we still have about three quarters of a cup of that demi glaze left so i'm going to add about a quarter of a cup of that to a pan along with an extra cup of chicken broth and another splash of that red wine and i'm going to get that on the heat and begin to reduce that now today I'm gonna to be using this black truffle butter. It's the holidays, it feels appropriate, and they're easily accessible and cheap or black truffle flavor, but unsalted butter works fine. And once the water's boiling, I'm gonna add salt to it. And now I've got my sauce nice and hot and my water boiling. I'm gonna crank the heat up on the sauce and, and begin really reducing that down. And then I'm gonna drop my pasta. And I'm gonna cook the pasta for three minutes. I'm gonna set a timer. Even though they might be floating after just a minute, you really wanna let them cook for that full three minutes because it is a folded pasta. You wanna make sure those edges get fully cooked. After three minutes, I'm gonna take a spider, I'm gonna fish out the pasta and add it directly into the broth, adding only the pasta water that comes with the pasta. We don't really need any more at this point. I'm gonna keep that heat on high, keep that boiling and reduce that broth down so it goes from this kind of loose, brothy consistency to a thick, glazy texture that coats each piece of pasta. Once we got that glazy texture, I'm gonna kill the heat and then I'm gonna add a big hunk of truffle butter. But we're just gonna slowly toss it and melt it in until that butter is completely melted. And then we're ready to serve. You could serve this as a main or you can serve it as little appetizers. You throw a few of these annulotti into the center of a plate, drizzle a little bit of that sauce right on top along with Parmigiano Reggiano. What you've got is a pasta that any restaurant Restaurant will serve for 30 or 40 dollars but you made at home for your family with love and it's gonna blow them away it's a beautiful thing it's got all those rich roasty flavors you expect at the holidays but it's just packaged in this brilliant little pasta shape recipe for this is gonna be in my holiday plan of attack link down in the description next year we're hoping to get a book printed but for now it's just an ebook there's a web portal where you download the most up-to-date version of this there's some bonus content there. And this and all my other holiday recipes will be in the plan of attack. That's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself. If you're enjoying my holiday recipes, may I suggest the only thing I will eat on Christmas morning, this new cinnamon bun video I just posted. Link's gonna be up on the screen along with a few others if you're interested. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching.